Today I'm going to make a beautiful red dye called Para Red, which is actually the very first Azo dye ever produced. This video is the final chapter in what's probably the longest synthesis I've ever done, with every video shown here being just one step in the enormous process. If you want to see how I got to this point, I've linked these videos in the description below. As a side note, I do plan to remake my aniline synthesis video since I feel my production quality was a bit too low for such an important chemical. In any case, to get started making para red, the first thing I had to do was dissolve 1.66 grams of paranitroaniline in 20 milliliters of 2 molar hydrochloric acid and carefully heat the mixture. Once the paranitroaniline was completely dissolved, I then added around 45 grams of ice, which reprecipitated the paranitroaniline as a fine suspension. Most of the ice will end up melting here, but there should be at least a little left to guarantee that the reaction mixture is sufficiently cold. This beaker was next transferred to an ice bath, and to it I added 1 gram of potassium nitrite dissolved in about 3 milliliters of water under constant stirring. This was allowed to continue reacting for about 15 minutes, which resulted in a lightening of the mixture as the reaction proceeded. What's happening here is called a diatoizationization reaction, and in the first step, potassium nitrite reacts with hydrochloric acid forming nitrous acid and potassium chloride. This nitrous acid then reacts with another molecule of hydrochloric acid forming water in the nitrosonium ion, which is an extremely strong electrophile. The nitrosonium ion then attacks the amine group which undergoes several rearrangement steps to eventually produce another molecule of water along with the diazonium salt paranitrobenzodiazonium chloride which is our intermediate product. One thing you might have noticed at this point if you saw my video on azoviolet is that this synthesis up to this point is nearly identical, and the procedure is basically word for word. This is a consequence of the fairly simple reaction type, but I figured I'd mention it anyway. Once the mixture has had about 15 minutes to sit and react, I went ahead and added around a quarter gram of urea to destroy any excess nitrate. This was allowed to react for another 5 minutes before slowly adding 1.73 grams of 2-naphthol dissolved in 15 milliliters of 2-molar sodium hydroxide, which will immediately react forming a dense red precipitate of para-red. The precipitate here is so dense that magnetic stirring quickly became useless, and to fix this I slowly added as much distilled water as I could without overfilling the beaker. This helped to get things moving again, and at this point I simply allowed the mixture to continue reacting at room temperature under constant stirring for a little over an hour. While this is doing its thing, I'll try to quickly explain that second reaction, which is a textbook example of an azo coupling. This is a basic EAS reaction wherein the diazonium salt is the electron-deficient electrophile and 2-naphthol is the electron-rich nucleophile. The hydroxyl group of 2-naphthol is a strong ortho and para director, but since para substitution is impossible here, the diazonium salt exclusively binds to the ortho position here. That's the entire process, and honestly these type of reactions are generally pretty simple and straightforward. The only thing you really need to be aware of throughout this whole process is that the diazonium intermediate salt is extremely unstable, and needs to be kept ice cold up to the point that it's reacted with the nucleophilic substrate in order to prevent it from decomposing. In any case, after the mixture had spent an hour reacting, it was next acidified with a few milliliters of 2 molar hydrochloric acid. The mixture was then transferred to my hot plate and heated under constant stirring until it was nearly boiling. The idea here is that para-red is only slightly soluble in cold water and dramatically more soluble in hot water. However, even at 100 degrees Celsius, I don't have nearly enough water here to even dream of dissolving it all the way. But I can dissolve enough that when it's allowed to cool back down to room temperature, enough will be recrystallized that filtration should be less of a complete nightmare. To that end, once the mixture was nearly boiling, it was taken off the heat and allowed to cool. Once it had cooled down to around room temperature, the slurry was next passed through vacuum filtration, which turned out to be a very long and annoying process due to the ultra-fine particle size of the para-red. As soon as all the water had been pulled off though, the product was thoroughly rinsed, transferred to a drying dish, and allowed to dry on my desk for several days. This stuff holds on to a ton of water, so drying it this way will take a really long time. There are obviously quicker methods if you're impatient, but I had other things to work on anyway. Once my para-red was completely dry, I weighed it for a final mass of 3.38 grams representing a 96% yield. This was pretty good, and in general these types of reactions are very high yielding. As a final demo, I thought it would be fun to show how you can actually dye some fabric with this stuff considering its main use is a fabric dye. 
Now, you might think that dyeing fabric with this chemical is something as simple as dissolving the para red in some kind of solvent and then dipping whatever fabric you'd like to dye into the mixture. While this procedure does somewhat work, the problem is that when it's applied this way, para red has very poor fastness, and as a result, it'll end up washing out pretty quickly. What you have to do instead in order to correctly apply this dye and ensure a high level of permanence is to conduct the azo coupling reaction directly within the fibers of the textile itself. To do this, I first dumped a 1 5th scale version of my acidic diazonium salt mixture into a 1 liter beaker. This was next diluted to around 500 milliliters along with some ice to prevent the unstable diazonium salt from decomposing. In a separate beaker, I next diluted a 1 5th scale quantity of my alkaline 2 naphthol mixture to a final volume of around 250 milliliters. I then immediately dipped a white cloth into the mixture and allowed it to sit for a while before carefully removing it and gently squeezing out a bit of the excess liquid. I then carefully unfolded it and slowly lowered it into the acidic diazonium salt bath which instantly dyed the fabric a brilliant red. This was again allowed to sit around for a minute, removed, rinsed thoroughly with water, and then run through the wash to test the fastness of the dye. And as you can see here, even after going through a full high heat wash and dry cycle, this cloth is still a very vibrant red. This may not be the most spectacular thing I've ever done on this channel, but considering this cloth is the end product of so much work, I plan to keep this thing around. You could also very easily make the argument that dyes like this one kicked off all of modern chemistry as well as the field of cancer research. If you'd like to go down this rabbit hole, the short story is that in 1856, an 18-year-old William Henry Perkin of Perkin Metal Acclaim accidentally synthesized aniline purple while trying to artificially synthesize quinine. This was the very first artificial dye and quickly became absurdly profitable leading to chemistry becoming an actual industry rather than just a field of scientific inquiry. Later on, workers in the aniline dye industry were found to be at a dramatically increased risk of bladder cancer, and this was one of the first clear examples of an occupational carcinogen. As a result, by the 1950s, the synthetic dye industry had helped transform our understanding of cancer and how to treat it. It is truly fascinating the more you read about it, and I do want to give a quick shout out to this wonderful subscriber for first sharing this with me. Anyway, with that, I'll go ahead and close here. I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.